one, two, one. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this week's talk. My name's Rebecca and I'm the BBI Security Officer for Queensland. And this is the third talk in our online uh, talk series on good BBI security. Our first one covered the BBI security basics. If you're able to tune in last week, we looked at brood diseases. And this week we're going to focus on Varroa and external bee parasites. Now, if you've missed any of the talks, you can click on the original links and that will take you through to the recordings. Only the ones that we've had so far and uh, in the ones in the future, after the live event, the recording will be available. So I've got a few people helping me out tonight. We've got Susie and Kelly who are helping me out with the technical side of things, and we've got some special guests. So we've got Hamish again, our APR officer for Queen, uh, one of our APR officers for Queensland. We've also also got Rob Stevens from the Varroa Eradication Program, and we've got Bex Sapupo from Incident Response. And so these guys are going to help me out with some of the questions later on. So let's um, jump right on in and talk about today's uh, topic, which is Varroa and external bee parasites. There we go. And so why would we want to check a hive for, for external parasites, external mites and, and other nasties? Well, we've already sort of covered this a little bit in that bee pests can pose a big threat to your hive, the honey industry and all those crops and native plants that rely on bees for pollination. But Varroa in particular has had devastating effects overseas where many, many beehives have collapsed and it's had a really big impact on their uh, honeybee industry. And so if we can um, make sure that we're checking our hives regularly and looking out for these things, it means we might be able to detect them early and have a better chance of eradication or management of the mites. So that's why it's, it's really crucial that you both, as a beekeeper, you understand what you're looking for and how to look for it and how to report it. Of course, it's also part of your general biosecurity obligation and it falls under making sure that you have checked your hive regularly for pests and diseases and reporting any notifiable pests or diseases. And the three pests that we're going to talk about tonight, which are, well, range of species, but the three main, three main groups are Varroa, uh, Tropolalaps and Varroa fly, and all these are reportable or notifiable pests in Queensland. So you need to let the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries know if you do suspect them or find them. So let's talk a little bit about these nasty pests. Varroa has uh, two species, Varroa destructor and Varroa, Varroa jacobsoni, and the Varroa destructor is generally uh, the nastier one, the one that has a, a much bigger impact on bee, uh, beehives. Both of them are external parasites. So what this means that lives on it means is that they live on the outside of the bees. And for Varroa, the female uh, mites will live on both the larval stages of the bees and the adult stages of the bees, but the males will only be found on the brood. Now the natural host in the past for Varroa mites has been Asian honeybees, and it's only been fairly recently that they've switched over to European honeybees. And as with many pests and diseases, when they switch to a new host, they often have much bigger impacts on that new host than what they did on the original host. And so that's why we can see there are such big problems when Varroa comes into new areas. Uh, one of the other things about Varroa that makes it so nasty is that not only does it impact the bees directly by feeding off their uh, hemolymph, which is like bee blood, but they also spread a whole range of different bee viruses. And these also contribute to overall health declines within the colony and often then to colony collapse. Now we have had some Varroa here in Australia. We've only had Varroa jacobsoni. And there's been three um, different incidents, one in 2016, one in 2019 and one to 20 where we've had some uh, mites found on bees in the Townsville area, and they're currently under eradication. And so maybe um, we'll, I'm not gonna to talk too much about that uh, now, but if you have questions, we can follow those up during the question and answer section. So what are the symptoms of Varroa? Well, unfortunately, often you don't see real strong and obvious symptoms of Varroa for often two to four years after 
the mites start infesting your hive. And so it can be quite a long time before you notice it if you're not looking really, really carefully. Some of the uh, signs or symptoms include the cell cappings on the brood can look like they've been chewed. Your bees might be crippled or, or crawling around, so they're not being able to fly very well. You might get a scattered brood pattern. Um, and you might also see that some of the larvae are either sunk, sort of slumped in their cells, or if they've been there a long time, they might have turned into a bit of a scale, a hard scale. Another key component to look for is low bee numbers. But most of these things you probably won't see until the mites have been there quite a long time. And so it's really important in order to um, check for mites that you do a, a sampling fairly regularly, either a sugar shake, an alcohol wash, and then a drone uncapping as well. And I'm gonna go through these in a bit more detail in a moment, how to undertake them. We also use sticky mats uh, for varroa mites, and these contain a miticide that kills the mite, and then the mites get stuck on those sticky mats. And we use those uh, for surveillance to check any of our um, hives. Particularly, we focus a lot on doing surveillance around ports where we could have incursions of mites coming in. So we wanna keep on top of those and checking them really regularly. The other uh, mite that I'm gonna talk about tonight is Tropolalep. And there are two species of Tropolalepsis as well. And these guys, their natural host is actually giant honeybees. So a little bit different, but again, they've moved over to European bees and have a bigger impact on European bees than they did on their original host, those are giant honeybees. Now, Tropolalepsis have pretty much the same kind of symptoms as Varroa, and they can also spread diseases, so all those uh, viruses, same way that Varroa spreads them around. So they can often look very similar within a hive. The main difference between Tropolalepsis and Varroa mites is that Tropolalepsis can't live very long on adult bees, so only about three days on an adult bee. So mostly they're found in the brood. So while we can look for Varroa mite using a sugar shaker and alcohol wash, as well as a, a drone uncapping, we can really usually only find um, the trop Tropolalepsis mites when we do a drone uncapping because that's where the majority of them are going to be. And the final pest that we're going to cover tonight is brawler fly. Now, brawler fly is actually found in uh, one region of Australia, and that's Tasmania, but it hasn't yet been found on the mainland, and hence we really want to keep an eye out for it and try and keep it out of the mainland if we can. Now, brawler fly are only found on adult bees. They don't um, feed on the larvae. And while uh, Tropolalaps and Varroa feed on the blood, the hemolymph of your adult bees, these guys are really just freeloaders hanging around. So they kind of grab onto the bees and, and go for a ride, but they also steal food from the bees as the bees are collecting food. So, you know, it's kind of like you know, having a, 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 an adult child hanging around um, at, at a grown-up home. So these guys, uh, when they are little, when they uh, lay eggs, they'll, the eggs will be laid in the cells they'll then hatch and they'll eat the wax and larvae um, throughout the, the brood frames. And the best way to find these guys are a sugar shake or alcohol wash. And that's because they're gonna be on those adult bees and not on the, on the larvae, which you would use a drone uncapping for. So focusing on the sugar shake and alcohol wash. And that's why it's really important to use a combination of all three, sugar shake, alcohol wash, and drone uncapping to make sure that you're checking for all of these different pests. So how are these guys spread around? Well, they're all pretty much spread in the same kind of manner. We've got uh, robber bees that we've talked about last week, and these are the bees that are going to another hive to steal honey or pollen and take back to their own hive, but they might bring with them or take with them uh, these pests. So they might take Varroa or Tropolalaps or even Brawler fly on their bodies, and then they, when they have close contact with other bees, they transfer them in there. Similarly, um, if we've got bees that have undergone drift, which is accidentally going back to the wrong hive, and these guys can take those pests with them as well. They can also be spread on infested hives and hive components and hive tools. So if you take a frame out of an infested hive and put it into another one, or you use the same tools on an infested hive as a clean one, you can transfer the pests over. They also can be spread pretty easily on things like your clothing. And so if you're wearing a beekeeping suit on uh, at a hive where you've got Varroa, that Varroa can crawl onto your suit 
because you bunch brush past them, they'll crawl around on your suit and then when you go to a new hive, they can crawl off and, and into that new hive. So beekeepers can also be able to spread these if they're not very careful. Now once um, the mites uh, get into the hive or, or the brawler fly, they will um, lay their eggs within the cell, within the brood cells. Now when we've got a uh, uh, varroa mites, both all of the cells, um, sorry, all of the eggs hatch out and the male and females will go through several larval stages and then they'll actually uh, mate within the cell and the males won't make it out of the cell. They will uh, die in there and it's the females who then emerge and uh, spread to new locations on the adult bees. Uh, brawler fry are a little different, as I said before, these guys will hatch out of the cell and they won't necessarily at that point in time stick to the bees, they might, but they might also crawl around the hive a bit as well before um, they get on an adult bee. The mites and the brawler fly can all move a little bit on their own as well. So they can get around the hive a little bit on their own. And as I said before, they could get onto your clothing or crawl onto tools and things. So that's important to keep in mind when it comes to managing the pests. So when should you be checking for these? You should really be doing it um, on a similar schedule to when you do your brood inspection. So at least twice a year, preferably kind of spring and autumn are good times to go about it. But if you can do it more often, that's great. Uh, anytime you move your hive, make sure that you've checked it before you move it. And anytime you notice that the bee numbers are really low and that's quite unusual or you wouldn't expect it and largely because that's one of those signs or symptoms of having external mites. And do your mite checking as part of your regular inspection of your hive. So last week we talked about um, doing an external observation of the hive, then looking at the in internal uh, areas of the hive boxes, doing a brood examination and then you can follow that up with a drone uncapping and a sugar shaker alcohol wash and then any other types of sampling that you might need to do. So it can just fit into your regu regular, regular schedule of checking your hives. What you'll need if you're doing a sugar shake, you'll want to have a container, a small white container and I find a yogurt Yogurt container or even better an ice cream dish is perfect for this with a bit of water in the bottom so about half or even a little about a quarter full of water. Um, you can also use a piece of white paper but it's not quite as effective as having the water. You also want a jar and you can see on the right hand side here I've got an example of the types of jars that I'm talking about. They need to be about 500 to 700 grams in size and it needs to have two lids. One it's normal solid lid and a second lid that's got either um, three to five millimeter holes drilled in it or an eight, uh, eighth inch gauze wire mesh. So you can see this here. And so lots of people ask me about these jars and I've given some out to each of the beekeeping clubs that I've gone to visit so far. So uh, if you wanna have a look at them or you wanna have a borrow of them, get in contact with your local beekeeping club and they should have one there that you can have a look at and, and, and have a go at using. And you can also make these at home. They're fairly uh, straightforward, just uh, needs a bit of handymaning. And there's also a few places that you can purchase them online. And so I've put in um, what will come up in the notes in the question and answer section soon. There'll be a link there through to uh, some instructions on how you can make your own sugar shake jars. Now, another thing you'll want is two tablespoons of icing sugar. Um, Icing sugar is a little bit different to icing mixture. Icing mixture will have corn flour in it and although it's okay, um, it's not quite as easy uh, for it to dissolve into the water. So if you can, try and get icing sugar instead of icing mixture. And sometimes a bit of newspaper can also be quite helpful to get your bees into your jar. Now if you're doing an alcohol wash, you want that same jar with the two different lids. You also want a piece of filter paper I find if you're really desperate, you can get by a little bit with a bit of tissue paper, but filter paper is much better. You want half a cup of methylated spirits and you can reuse this methylated spirit. So even if you have a, to do a bunch of hives, you really only need half a cup. And again, that newspaper can be quite helpful. And if you 
doing a drone uncapping, you'll want a comb scratcher or honey scratcher, which you can find at any beekeeping store supplies. And people often have it already for, for managing their hives. Now for any of these, I would also strongly suggest to invest in a magnifying glass. What we're going to be looking for is really, really, really tiny little dots and being able to tell the difference between a mite and a piece of dirt is really tricky without a good magnifying glass. So it's, it's a good investment. So what I'm going to do now is uh, just switch over to a little video that I've got and we're going to talk about how to undertake these different tests. So let's start with a sugar shake. Now a sugar shake, um, you want to take your jar and if you can start by putting your icing sugar in your jar. Before you put your bees in, it's much easier to do it then. Now the important thing here is you need to sift your icing, icing sugar through a sifter fairly soon before you undertake your sugar shake test. Now you notice in this one, in this video, I have done it the night before and it was a very wet, humid day and it got all clumpy and lumpy and it wasn't anywhere near as effective. So if you can um, sift it out just before you use it, it's much, much better. So I've got two tablespoons of icing sugar here. You want one to start with, so about half of what's in this container here, tipping it on into your jar. Then what you want to do is to take uh, several frames out of your hive. We suggest you try and do it from at least three different frames on your hive and preferably those middle ones. So we talked last uh, talk about how those middle ones are often where you see a lot of the uh, brood and you also see the pests and diseases. And so if you can work on the middle ones, they're probably the best ones to go for. So pull out your frame and uh, you can either shake it into a piece of newspaper or you can do this little trick here where you roll the jar down the backs of the bees and they tend to just fall off into the jar and that's actually quite efficient. You want about a cup full of bees so that's about roughly 300 bees uh, into your jar and for a sugar shake if you get your queen bee it's okay we're not going to kill the bees um, if you can find her first and put her aside that's even better you won't damage her and you'll be sure but if you can't that you can find her or you can't identify you can still do a sugar shake and so I always suggest to people if you're a new beekeeper or not very experienced or you're not very good at finding your queen go with a sugar shake rather than an alcohol wash. An alcohol wash can be a little bit more effective but again if you if you're risking um, possibly hurting your queen bee or killing your queen bee um, if you can't find her effectively. Now, although it's called a sugar shake, we don't want to roughly shake our bees. We want to really gently roll them. So you can see here, I'm turning them like this in my hands and I'm coating them in icing sugar. So you want to do this for about two to three minutes. And what's happening is that icing sugar is breaking those little bonds between the feet of the mites or the brolify and um, the bee. And so the mites and the brolify will fall off into the icing sugar. Then what we want to do is swap lids to take our solid lid off and don't worry too much about the bees flying out. They're generally pretty dopey at this stage. Uh, put your gauze lid on, take your container with the water in it and give it a bit of a shake. Now, if you don't have a container with water, you've got a white piece of paper. It can be a lot more difficult to see the little bit. And that's just because in the water, the icing sugar will dissolve and all you'll be left with are the little spots on the top of the water. So once we've shaken as much of that icing sugar as we can out, and you can see here the humidity is against me, it's gone quite clumpy. You then want to take a second lot of icing sugar, so your second tablespoon, add it into your jar with your same lot of bees and do the whole process again. So put your solid lid on and then give them a twirl gently for another two to three minutes. Then we want to switch back to our gauze lid again to take the final amount of icing sugar and tip it into our little container. So once we've done that, we can then uh, put our bees back. So uh, as I said before, a sugar shake won't kill your bees and your bees will actually have an awesome afternoon licking all that icing sugar off their body. So they'll actually be pretty happy about the whole situation. Make sure, of course, that your bees are going back into your into your brood box, particularly if you're not 100% sure you don't have the queen in that sugar shake jar. So then once we've put all our bees back, inspect your container 
And what you're going to see is a whole bunch of little brown dots. So it's a little bit tricky to see here. I'm going to put a picture in a minute. Here we go of what we want to find. So at your top, you can see uh, what a brawler fly looks like. Over on the right hand side, we've got an example of Varroa. At the bottom, we've got Tropolalax. And on the left hand side is actually a pollen mite. So these guys, you can tell uh, amongst all the other dirt, pollen and debris, in that they'll be far more regular in shape than your other bits of pollen and stuff on, in your dish. So have a look, look for anything that looks smooth and regular and anything that you can sort of see little bits of legs on and then grab your magnifying glass and have a much closer look so you can see what's there. Now, if you've got any of these, of course, it's important to let us know as soon as possible and to hold on to them. So don't get rid of them. Um, if they're in the water and you do have filter paper, you can put them um, through a piece of filter paper uh, so you can collect them. If not, just put your uh, water with them aside uh, and give us a call. Now let's move on to an alcohol wash. We're gonna do a very similar process here. Start with an empty jar and this time you've got to make sure you don't have your queen. So first of all, double check you've got a queen put aside safely. And then collect about half a cup of bees or 150 bees. So that's uh, quite a lot less than what you need for your uh, sugar shake. Then once you've got that, you want to grab some methylated spirits, just the kind that you get you know, from the supermarket or hardware store. And you want to add half a cup of methylated spirits into your sugar shake jar. Now, because our bees aren't going to survive this, you can actually be pretty rigorous. And this one, unlike the sugar shake, you can shake it. So grab your jar once the lid's uh, on securely and give it a really darn good shake. And that's to try and again, break those bonds between the bees and the mites legs so that they can fall off into the methylated spirits. So once you've given it a darn good shaking, then grab uh, your filter paper. I also find to have a little funnel is quite helpful um, and that um, just holds the paper better. And if you pour your methylated spirits into a little jar again, you, of course you can use it again for the next hive or for this hive again in the future. Make sure that your paper is pushed in so you've got a little bit of a dint, otherwise um, it'll uh, spill out the sides. It can take quite a while for you to be able to pour it through. So have a bit of patience um, for it to see through the filter paper. So first you want to switch on to your lid with the gauze because we don't want the bees going onto the filter paper, just the mites. And then tip our fluid in. And then inspect the paper. So just like looking in the white dish, we're looking for regular shapes we're looking for shapes that um, have little legs and your magnifying glass is going to be really, really helpful for this one. Now, if you do see anything, make sure that you fold your piece of filter paper in quarters so it's safe and then give us a call. And just to give you an idea of how tiny uh, what things that we're looking for are, and I'm really sad that I don't get to see you all in person because to show you the little um, samples is amazing, um, you'll note that they're very, very little. So um, you, you probably will really need that magnifying glass. Next thing we're going to talk about is drone uncapping. So the first thing you want to do if you're going to do some drone uncapping is to know what you're looking for. So you can see here at the top in the red circle, we've got some drone brood and they are, uh, have very raised cappings, so very concave cappings. In, a, in the middle there on, or off to the left, we've got some worker brood. And those cappings are very flat. And if you remember from last week, if your cappings are concave and dark looking, that's a sign that they might be worker brood that are sick or diseased. And you can also see here there is some uncapped brood as well. So the one we're going to focus on for drone uncapping is those uh, raised ones. Many uh, hives at different times of year might have very few. You want to try and do as many as you can. But in this case, you can see I only could find just a few here. You want to get your capping scratcher as level as you can with the frame and gently push it through. Don't want to be too close to the top of the cappings because that sometimes then just pulls all the way through and doesn't pull the drone out. Once you're in there, gently wiggle it from side to side 
and pull your drone out. So you can see these ones here are a little bit old and so it can be quite difficult to see the mites on the older ones. If they're much younger drone brood, they'll be far pearlier white in colour and you won't have any of this uh, coloration that you see here. Uh, and that can make it much harder to see the mites on there. So you want to uh, have a really good look. And what you're looking for here, as you can see, uh, a larvae that's a bit younger. And you'll notice that there are dark uh, spots, which are the mites. But you may also see here um, that there are a little dark spots of the eyes. And you've got, don't panic if you do see spots. Look a little closer, double check that it's not eyes uh, so that you're not fooled by that. Okay. Now we'll just switch back here. So if you do um, see mites or brawlify or suspect them, make sure that you collect them and ho hold on to them. Um, put them in a small steel container in the fridge if you can, and then uh, either call the exotic plant pest hotline or call the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. And we'll give you more instructions on what to do next. Um, the other key thing when you look finishing off your observation, whether or not you see something or not, it's important to record. Uh, jot down uh, the date, what inspection methods you use. So let's say you were doing a hive check and you did a brood inspection, a sugar shake and a drone uncapping. And that way you know that's what you look for. Any pests or symptoms that were present and any management you put in place. And this is really important. It not just helps you as a beekeeper to keep an eye on things and make sure you're checking it regularly and, and know what you saw last time. If this time things don't look quite right, you can go back to your notes and go, oh, but last time it was fine, so it must be a fairly new problem. It's really essential for us um, at, at Biosecurity because if we've got beekeepers regularly checking for mites and saying, I checked on this date, I did this and I didn't see anything, that lets us know um, a bit of a timeline about how things might have spread and how far they might have spread if we do have an incursion. So that information is, is really essential. So for more information about mites or about bee biosecurity in general, remember um, great resources are the Australian Honeybee Industry Code of Biosecurity Code of Practice. Uh, the Biosecurity Manual for Beekeepers, the Be Aware website. Um, there's also the Bolt Training, the Biosecurity Bees online training course. And send me an email if you want further information about that. Of course, you can call me, your Bee Biosecurity Officer, um, or your local APR officer. And of course, your local beekeeping club. I've gone around and done lots of um, demonstrations at different beekeeping clubs on the two, on the three different methods that we talked about tonight. And Hopefully, uh, when COVID lets me go out again, I'm going to continue to go back to the different beekeeping clubs. So that's a great place to come and see a demonstration of how to undertake these different processes. So we might move on now to uh, any questions anybody has. And just Give me five seconds, guys, to get this up and running. Okay. So some questions here I'm going to run through. Um, oh, here's one a bit tricky. Maybe one of these other guys, uh, Rob, maybe you might know this one. How was it discovered icing sugar was the best component or uh, best compound for doing a sugar shake test? Do you know, Rob? I, I, I actually don't. I, I know the, the method has been used for a long time and it is used internationally. Um, with the alcohol wash, it's called something else overseas. They call that an ether roll, but I couldn't tell you where the origin or how they discovered the sugar breaks that bond. Sorry. Great question, Jen. I will look that one up and maybe I'll hopefully have a question for you next, uh, next during the next talk. Uh, sorry, an answer for you next time. Ah, good question. Uh, here's an anonymous one. Uh, does sh the sugar shake or, or methylated spirits kill the mites or are they alive in the water? So in the water, you're probably not going to kill them, certainly not straight away. They'll still be alive. So that's a really good point. Make sure you um, are, are not leaving them somewhere where they can 
swish over to the edge of the water and crawl out um, if you find them. Put them in a, a sealed container. The methylated spirits, however, is very likely to kill those mites. So they're probably not going to go anywhere and, and, and that will probably be the end of them. So good question. Uh, another question here, a sugar shake versus alcohol wash, which is better? Um, why are there different approaches? Uh, sugar shake seems better because it doesn't kill a bee. I'm going to throw this one over to Rob as well. I would say sensitivity wise, the alcohol wash probably has a, a larger, um, a better chance of getting the mites to dislodge from the bees. Uh, the sugar shake is obviously the easier method. So if you're a little bit less confident and you're not too good at finding your queen, the sugar shake is definitely your better option. Uh, but sensitivity wise, your alcohol wash is probably going to pick up more mites than your sugar shake would if you've got that confidence to do it. Thanks, Rob. Uh, another awesome question here is how do you recommend disposing of dead bees post alcohol shake? Um, maybe Hamish, you could do this one. Oh, thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah, when I've done them in the past, um, of course, unfortunately, you do have a, a handful of dead bees and um, I've just um, scraped a bit of a hole in the um, in the earth and um, and put them in there and covered them up, that sort of approach. Um, I guess you don't want um, other bees or other insects or any animals um, um, getting into them and um, and uh, either eating or um, or robbing them. So um, probably best to cover them. Or I guess you could just put them in the um, in your garbage waste as well. But just remember they are um, laden with um, with uh, the metho um, or the alcohol. So um, you just be mind need to be mindful of that. Mm. Thanks, Hamish. Um, here's one I think uh, Rob probably can answer because he probably does this fairly often, uh, and that is where can I get sticky mats? Oh, OK. Um, we actually get those from a, a company here in Australia. They're just basically uh, uh, sticky paper with one side. You can uh, get a couple of different versions of it. Um, but I, I, sorry, I don't know the name of the company off the top of my head, but we just cut it down to size so it um, it fits in the, in the tray for the sticky mats. But uh, basically you could use anything that's um, got that adhesive quality on one side, basically. Thanks, Rob. Um, here's Can really I just... Um, oh, sorry, go Hamish, yep. So, sorry, Becky, I just um, might just continue on with that. Um, I guess that's only half the story though with the sticky mat. Um, you will have a problem um, sourcing um, uh, the pest strips um, in order to complete the, the task. So just be mindful of that. Of course, if you did put a you know sticky mat in, um, you could observe what naturally drops to the bottom, but um, just be mindful that um, you wouldn't be able to source this, these pest strips. Thanks Hamish. Um, here's a really interesting question, and I, I actually wish I'd remembered to say this as you were talking about it, and that is, can you find Varroa or Brawler on dead bees around your hive? Now, it's really, really hard to see both of these pests on bees, largely because they're very, very tiny and they're kind of the same colour.